Yo, good day ladies and gentlemen, it's your man Wise Black and you are now tuned into the Bull Lifer Podcast, a Chicago Bulls podcast where I bring you the latest and greatest news about our beloved Chicago Bulls and all on the Spreaker Network. But to not waste any time and to get right down to business, the Chicago Bulls are rumored to be interested in the Utah Jazz's three-time Defensive Player of the Year big man Rudy Gobert and are also said to be making googly eyes at the Knicks free agent center Mitchell Robinson. Now these reports come from a couple of different sources with the first being the Ringers Kevin O'Connor citing that the Chicago Bulls are said to be one of the teams targeting the the defensive-centric big and recently Jake Fisher also doubled down on the rumor regarding the Bulls and their legitimate interest in Gobert. Now, this news begs quite a few questions in my mind, which are if the Chicago Bulls do go after Gobert and are actually able to get him, who leaves the team? Meaning, who is leaving this this team going to the Utah Jazz? in a trade for Rudy Gobert? And secondly, how would Gobert fit on a roster with not too many floor spaces and also one of its stars main go-to spot on the floor being closer to the basket with the mid-range and DeMar DeRozan? And lastly, would it be a better idea for the Bulls to put all their eggs in the Mitchell Robinson basket? So with that being said, let's get to the first hypothetical. Who gets traded in a deal to the Utah Jazz in a trade such as this? He's going to garner a lot in the trade for the team that's giving him up. Meaning the Utah Jazz more than likely want the Bulls' future in exchange for their present. And as you might guess, Patrick Williams would be the starting point in a trade talk of this magnitude. But question is, are Arturis Karnasovas and Mark Eversley ready to give up on the potential of their first ever draft prospect with the Chicago Bulls? But to this point, the second year Ford has yet to break out and showcase superstar potential. In 71 games for the for his first year with the Chicago Bulls, Patrick averaged 9.2 points per game, 4.6 rebounds per game, and 1.4 assists per game with a decent field goal percentage of 48% overall. Now, these numbers don't necessarily jump off the page, and neither does the eye test help Patrick's rookie season case for superstar potential, at least in my opinion. There would be many times where Patrick would defer to the veterans on the team. And mind you, this is prior to the the arrival of DeMar DeRozan and Nikola Vucevic. And Williams' reluctancy to shoot and be aggressive with the ball were not hopeful signs of a player you would expect to take over as the best player for your franchise one day either, right? But with that being said, in his second season, the in the fractional amount of games he did play, one could argue that he had a legitimate reason to defer to his teammates given the near the newly acquired offensive talent on the squad his numbers nearly mirrored the ones from the the season prior but we did see differences in his last few games of the season on april 10th 2022 patrick scored a career high 35 points going 10 for 21 from the field three of four from deep and 12 of 14 at the charity strike versus the minnesota timberwolves And sure, you could say this was, whatever, an end-of-season garbage game, but what it did prove was Patrick's potential as a scorer and the gradual shedding of his passive nature. In the last 10 games of the season for the month of April, Patrick scored in double digits 7 out of the 10 games and was made to be the focal point of the offense every time the opportunity presented itself. Bottom line is, teams see what Patrick could be based on the few and far in between flashes of an elite two-way player with a six-foot-seven frame with a natural bulk to go along with it. So again, adding him in this trade would be a no-brainer. The Jazz would also have to take Rudy's replacement in Nikola Vucevic as well, pretty much completely reshaping the team's identity going from defensive to offensively focused. And the shooting potential of a Kobe White behind Donovan Mitchell should sweeten the deal for the Jazz as well. Now, should they also want draft compensation? Anything better than one second round pick gets in the fleece territory. And I think Arturis and Mark begin to back out because, yes, while Gobert is the ultimate defensive anchor, he clearly has flaws creating for himself offensively, so much so to the point where he gets played off of the floor in the playoffs. And this has been the case for 
pretty much several several years to this point. So me personally, I would hope Acme gets repulsed by the idea of adding any first round draft picks to this deal, unless I guess if the pick was extremely protected, and I mean insanely protected, like top 15 and top 20 protected. Rudy Gobert is turning 30 at the end of this month and already making north of 40 million per year with about three years left on that contract, which could mean the Bulls could potentially put themselves in an even worse position than they already are in with Vucevic should Gobert begin to decline after turning 30. Now, obviously, 30 isn't old, but when it comes to bigs whose games is predicated on physicality, jumping, and I mean, I don't necessarily want to say athleticism because he isn't extremely athletic, but when I think about Rudy Gobert, I think of a player like, say, uh, DeAndre Jordan, whose play style was fairly similar to Gobert, and now he's not even a rotation player in the NBA. And while Gobert isn't the lob threat that DJ was, his game is still much closer to his than a finesse center like Vooch or Jokic. But should a trade go down between the two teams, I bet Vooch and Patrick are the first two involved and possibly even Kobe White. You would have to throw in Kobe White as a sweetener. I mean, having him coming off of the bench or however they should choose to use Kobe White. I mean, he, one, makes the money work. But two, I mean, he has potential as a go-to scorer coming off of your bench. Kobe White has huge six-man-of-the-year potential, I believe. But he just isn't necessarily doing it in this Chicago Bulls system but I believe if he were to go somewhere else he could possibly I don't know I, he could possibly resurrect his potential as I don't know like a, a, a very um, offensive focused player in the NBA and really be a key piece to a team especially by him not being Acme's guy I don't necessarily think that they're attached to him too much now should this hypothetical come to fruition, we'd be looking at a roster of Lonzo Ball, hopefully, please get well soon, uh, Zach Levine, hopefully, please resign, <laughs> DeMar DeRozan, Rudy Gobert, Alex Caruso, and Ayo as his core pieces, and insert potential draft prospect or free agent acquisition at the four. And you know what? Now that I think about it, who they get to replace Patrick at the four would be very interesting as well because should they resign Zach and also sign Gobert, they'd be well into the luxury tax territory. But they do still have a mid-level exception from the Daniel Tice trade and a $10.3 million non-taxpayer mid-level exception available in free agency this summer. So ideally, they want a stretch four, right? Because this team has to get well-rounded and add some shooting. Like last year, they were basically the worst shooting team in the league. Like by volume, and I know percentage-wise, they weren't the worst. But by volume, they just didn't shoot enough at all. But that may be actually easier said than done when it comes to adding a stretch four because there aren't many out there in free agency currently. You have... The likes of uh, former Bulls uh, Bobby Portis, but I'm almost sure he's enjoying his situation in Wisconsin, so I doubt he'd be an option for the Bulls. Uh, you also have Nicola B Nicholas Batum out there, and I believe he is actually very gettable for the mid-level exception. You know, and and he shot around what 40% from deep last season, so he would be nearly a seamless fit at the four. Plus, he only made 3.2 million last season with the Clippers, so I'm pretty sure he wouldn't mind a pay raise. Uh, you have Melo out there, but <laughs> I'm sorry, not for me. Mel Melo is just, he, he's not for me. I love Melo, Hall of Famer, and all of that, but uh, putting Melo on this team at the four would be a disaster if you ask me um Otto Porter who's playing in the finals as we speak and who's actually making decent contributions will be available for free agents free agency this summer so I mean you definitely could have something there and even PJ Tucker is out there man um I, I know he isn't the best floor spacer 
I believe he shot around, what, 40% from deep last year, but it was also on very low volume at about two to three attempts per game. But, I mean, honestly, I wouldn't be mad if we were to have him on this team for obvious reasons, right? We need toughness and, and tone setters, period. And if you undermine these traits in basketball, just look no further than the teams playing deep into the playoffs and the finals this season. The Warriors with Draymond, uh, uh, the Celtics with Marcus Smart, the Heat who have Jimmy and, and PJ Tucker, right? So that trait, like having a guy who is a tone setter and who brings toughness to your team is very, very necessary. So will Billy Donovan be able to get a team with Zach Levine, DeMar DeRozan and Rudy Gobert to compete for a championship? I believe it will be very highly plausible as long as, like I said earlier, they add shooting. Not even going as far as asking for premium 3 and D players, but at the very least, 2 to 3 extra, 38 to 40% shooters. They don't necessarily have to be the best defenders if Gobert's on the roster anyway, right? Not to mention Lazo, Caruso, Io, who are all very serviceable per perimeter defenders. They're going to presumably cut bait with a lot of the bench guys from last season like uh, Tristan Thompson, Matt Thomas, Tony Bradley, uh, uh, Troy Brown Jr., etc. So there will be roster spots to fill, and I just pray that they're filled with a few snipers on this payroll. Now, if that should take place, the Bulls will be golden and primed to go at it with pretty much any team in the league because they will be well balanced with elite scores in DeMar and Zach, floor spacing with the hypothetical shooters that I just mentioned, uh, and that's on top of Zach and Lonzo's floor spacing abilities, uh, elite perimeter defensive help with our three backcourt players and Alex, Zoe, and Io, and lastly, the three-time defensive player of the year in the middle, stopping nearly everything that gets inside of five feet to the basket. So, it honestly gets me, look, look, man, it, it honestly gets me excited just thinking about it. But of course, these are all just hypotheticals and what ifs. And I mean, we shall see if anything like this does come to fruition. I definitely hope. But lastly, would it make sense money wise and future wise for the Chicago Bulls to try their chances at Mitchell Robinson instead? Now, looking at these two players comparatively Gobert obviously wins the better player award right but Mitchell Robinson doesn't come with the same price tag nowhere near close to it and he also has more youth on his side being only 24 years of age Mitchell Robinson is damn near Rudy Gobert 2.0 just a bit underdeveloped which I believe would come with more time and uh, better training and coaches and everything like that Looking at Mitchell Robinson's stats from last season, he averaged 8.5 points per game, 8.6 rebounds per game, and 1.8 blocks per game on 76% shooting from the field, man. Like, the dude does not miss. And, and that's mainly, primarily because all of his points basically come from, come from dunks and, and putbacks. And get this, though. He only averaged four shots per game last season, and he made three out of four of them. So putting he and Lonzo in a pick and roll would at least double that number because Zoe is one of the better passers in the league, and as well as Mitchell Robinson being an elite rim running center. So the fit would simply be perfect. And when you look closer at Mitchell's advanced stats per 48 minutes, he averages 15.8 points. 7.7 .7 offensive rebounds, 16 total rebounds, and 3.5 blocks. And I mean, I, so I look at advanced stats because I think it's a decent metric to look at the potential of a player. So that's more so why the, the only time that I'll really look at advanced stats and his are pretty telling. Like Mitchell Robinson has a lot of potential to develop into the player that Rudy Gobert is right now. So we can't necessarily overlook Mitchell Robinson based on his less than stellar numbers. And now looking at Gobert's stats of 15.6 points per game, 14.7 rebounds per game, and 2.1 blocks per game, those are clearly 
the stats of an elite center in the NBA, right? Like, hands down, obviously, Gobert is beastie. But we have to get to the negatives of these two players. While Gobert wouldn't fool anyone into thinking he's a good free throw shooter, he's significantly better than Mitchell's 48% at the line compared to Rudy Gobert's 69% last season. Neither of the two possess great playmaking abilities like passing or creating their own shots, which has proven to be detrimental for the Utah Jazz pretty much every year in the playoffs the last five seasons. Now, is this partially due to maybe lack of good coaching in, in certain areas? Possibly. Possibly so, but do I have confidence in Billy Donovan's ability to do better, to do a better job than now former coach of the Utah Jazz, Quinn Snyder? Can't say that I do, and that's not to take shots at Billy Donovan, but Quinn Snyder is considered to be one of the better coaches in the league, and he had a roster that isn't a whole lot different than the hypothetical one we're discussing right now. That team had Mike Conley, who isn't Lonzo Ball, but who is a very serviceable point guard in the NBA with a lot of playoff experience and basically point guard skills that you want on your team. Donovan Mitchell has been compared to Zach Levine for quite some time now, given how both are athletic wings with range and, and three level scoring abilities. Uh, you have Joe Ingles, who is by no means a DeMar DeRozan, but having a knockdown shooter at the three is nothing to sniff at. And, and really, I would probably more so compare uh, Jordan Clarkson to DeMar in terms of scoring ability. And I don't believe that's in any slight against DeMar DeRozan compar comparing him to Jordan Clarkson just when it comes to points more so, because I think it's pretty feasible given the fact that Clarkson is a six man of the year candidate nearly every year since he's gone to the Jazz and he actually won it last season and when it comes to the four position neither team has had uh, a four that has been very effective right so I say all of this to ask you the listener do you think bringing Rudy Gobert to the Chicago Bulls would be sizably more beneficial than choosing the much cheaper and younger Mitchell Robinson instead and listen I'm not trying to sway you to one way or the other because both have benefits to them right Sign and Gobert would drop in an experienced best defensive big in the league who would instantly correct a major need for your team and possibly even put them in real championship contention with the Milwaukee's the Heat, and the Celtics oh and yo I, I also can't fail to mention you'd also then have somewhat of an answer for your arch nemesis Joel Embiid in Philly. Only thing is, he may not be a better candidate for your long-term core considering his age, and he also will eat up a lot of your cap space, dampening your ability to add better role players to the roster. Now, in the case of Mitchell Robinson, he lacks the experience or the current production of a Rudy Gobert, right? And he's a, a, a very poor free throw shooter as well so he probably end up getting played off of the court down a stretch of playoff games because a lot of teams will more than likely just f hack him and and force him to try and win you the game at the free throw line and and those chances are pretty much slim to none but are you willing to overlook those issues seeing as how he's much younger meaning he has more time to develop and could be a long-term core piece to your squad. And also the fact that he would give you very similar production to a Rudy Gobert at a fraction of the cost, which would then uh, uh, give the team more airspace to be able to sign role players. So hearing all of that, it's not just a no-brainer decision in my humble opinion because both would bring their own beneficial aspects to the team and at the same time they're both they're both going to do very similar things the ultimate question you have to ask yourself is do i go for now with maybe a two to three year championship window with demar uh, uh rudy and zach as the big three or 
do I choose the future and lean on the side of development by keeping a younger core in Patrick Williams, Ayo Basumu, Lonzo Ball, Zach Levine as a star and with the acquisition of Mitchell Robinson? Now, what do I think Acme would do if they had to choose between the two? I honestly believe they would push all their chips in and go with the big three of Zach, DeMar, and Rudy. For all the obvious reasons I explained earlier, and, and given the fact that I believe they want to capitalize on what DeMar did last year as well. But not only that, I believe Levine would want the team to uh, take the all-in approach as opposed to the future outlook simply because he's ready to win now and he wants teammates who give them the best possible chance to do so. Now, while I say this, Let's, let's also keep in mind it could possibly backfire, of course, because you can you, you have to look no further than out west with the with the with the Lakers and how listening to LeBron instead of you know listening to their own instincts and how it backfired on them. So just think, should DeMar DeRozan decline considerably next season? And that, that's no jinx against him, but the, 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 these are just real questions that you have to ask. That would obviously be tragic. And the same goes for Gobert and his production. What if his, what if his production starts to lapse some? But at the same time, the same could be said with the young players not developing. So... <laughs> It's definitely a pickle, man. Um, but nonetheless, what do you guys think? What would you do if you were the Bulls front office facing a situation between signing Gobert or Mitchell Robinson? Should they be able to? But also with all of the other fa but also with all of the other factors that I listed. All I can say is I'm glad I'm not the GM because that would be highly stressful. But, I mean, listen, that's why they get paid the big bucks. Now, me, myself, I would probably go with... I would probably go with the future squad, keeping Patrick and signing Mitchell just because I don't think he's too far off from the production capabilities of a Gobert. And I'd also be able to pay more for floor spacing to, you know, put around Zach and DeMar. But... What do you guys think? I mean, that that's more so my thinking just because I don't know. I guess I have more of a long term outlook when it comes to the Chicago Bulls and, and what they could truly be. I honestly do believe that Mitchell Robinson has a ceiling of a Rudy Gobert. And <laughs> I don't know, man, maybe this is to a fault, but because I know us Chicago Bulls fans, we tend to get pretty attached to the players that come here, but I, I just would be highly pissed if Patrick Williams were to go to another team and, and, and blossom into a star, even if not a superstar, but if he were to go to a, another team and just average like 20 points per game and 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 seven rebounds and, and four assists or something like that like I, I would be highly pissed bro no lie even if he turned out to be like the second option on a championship team like and i honestly believe that patrick williams has that ability so that's the reason why i would be reluctant to pull the trigger on just going after rudy gobert but nonetheless i have to say i would not be mad at all it's just looking at the vucevic situation right now that we're in and how vucevic looked last season compared to his years with the magic and it, it was pretty obvious right vooch is on the other side of 30 and like everyone knows when it comes to centers a lot of times but i mean also while i say this though vooch's game should translate into latter year into the latter years of his career so it's, it's pretty odd but nonetheless he clearly has lost a step vucevic did not look good last year at all and you cannot tell me that he didn't have the opportunities he had opportunities to knock down shots he was just breaking them I, I would damn near pull my hair out every time he would be at the back close to the basket within five feet and just miss bunnies like that, that I, I would get so ticked off 
every time Vucevic would be open for a pick and pop in a pick and roll situation and just miss the mid range or taking like eight threes per game almost and and and, and bricking pretty much like 80 percent of them like it, it was crazy man it was crazy and i i get i'm exaggerating there the numbers are off a bit but you get what i'm saying Vucevic did not look good last year and I, and i believe with uh zach and damar out there on the court on the court with him for most of the time let's not forget zach and damar was playing together for most of the time with vooch the team just went on a down, downward spiral once Levine and, or uh, excuse me, once Alice Caruso and Lonzo Ball went down. So we can't necessarily say that Vooch didn't have open shots. He definitely had open shots. He just wasn't knocking them down. But anyway, man, I, <laughs> I don't want to go too much on a tangent and make this podcast that long. So I'm, I think I'm going to go ahead and end it here and call it one. So that's my time, you guys. Thank you for listening to the Bull Lifer podcast. And listen, please let me know if there is any content ideas you'd like me to release. And I will do so as quickly as possible. Um, Again, thank you for listening to the Bull Lifer podcast. And don't forget to check me out on the Spreaker Network. It's a podcast network that I'm now using. And I'm also getting back to my social accounts on Twitter and Instagram. So you can connect with me there as well at Radical Under score creator on both networks and yeah that's pretty much it guys so until next time believe in good chicago peace